Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Packers Unscripted from Packers.com. I am Mike Spofford, joined by my partner in crime, Weston Hodkowitz. We're coming to you here from our studios at Lambeau Field. We're a little late getting into the studio this week, Wes, but it's been kind of a busy week with regard to the Packers making their roster decisions, trimming things down to the initial 53-man, or I guess at the moment 52-man <laughs> roster for the 2021 season. I want to start with what I think are the two biggest pieces of news to come out of the roster decisions from this week. One is that the Packers decided to put David Bakhtiari on regular season PUP. That means physically unable to perform. He was on the PUP list for all of training camp. Starting the regular season there means that he is out for a minimum of the first six weeks of the regular season. So Elton Jenkins will be this team's left tackle for at least the first six games of 2021. And the other big piece of news is the Packers are going to have a new punter in 2021 with the release of J.K. Scott and a trade in the work. So I will let you start on those two nuggets and let me know your thoughts. One I thought was kind of a little bit of the inevitable. One kind of caught me by surprise. Yeah. And, and really the decision at punter was the only thing that I think kind of uh, surprised me throughout this process. And generally speaking, I thought Green Bay really did win the roster reduction. I think they put together a really strong 16-man practice squad, and I, I like the way they built the 53. It made a lot of sense. Uh, for, for Bakhtiari, though, this was something that I, I actually have to admit I was not fully educated on. I originally was operating under the assumption the Packers would be able to bring him back onto the, the active roster and then place him on injured reserve. That is not the case. If a guy is going to be placed in IR, he has to pass a physical first and then either have, you know, whether it would be an aggravation or a different injury, then be eligible for IR. So Bakhtiari actually wasn't uh, going to be able to go that route. In the past, that never mattered. But with the way the NFL has shifted to having a three-week injured reserve now, right. that's why it was sort of a topic. So what the facts are is that he's on the physically unable to perform list regular season. That takes him out for the first six games of the year here. He would be eligible to come back for Washington. For a lot of organizations, for a lot of football teams, this would be doomsday-type news to lose a five-time all-pro left tackle. The Green Bay Packers, not saying they don't want to have David Bakhtiari out there, <laughs> right. but they have probably as good of a safety net as you're going to find in the NFL with Elton Jenkins being able to play that position. There were so many articles I read this summer, Mike, about teams that were dealing with injuries at left tackle, the Indianapolis Colts among them, and there were a lot of questions as far as who was going to be able to man that position. Yeah. Since the day that this team reported back in July, that has not been a question here. Elton Jenkins has been the guy, and the Packers feel pretty good about him going into the regular season. Yeah, and as much as the Packers do feel good about the way things are set up on the offensive line, with Elton Jenkins moving to left tackle, looks like you're going to have a uh, rookie starting at guard in Royce Newman. We all know, obviously, since the day he arrived, uh, Josh Myers will be the rookie second-round draft pick starting at center. As good as the Packers feel about their offensive line and how it sets up to navigate this absence of Bakhtiari, we do have to make one thing clear, and the the status of the offensive line didn't really have to do with the decision on Bakhtiari. Yeah. This decision on Bakhtiari is about protecting a major investment in one of the best players in the game. The Packers recently extended him, signed him to a big long-term contract. The last thing they are going to do is jeopardize that by rushing him back and bringing him back too early. This wasn't going to be a case of, you know, oh, well, if they don't have Elton Jenkins to play left tackle and there's all these questions, we're going to rush David Brock. Right. No, that's not what the approach of this organization was going to be. They do feel good about where they are on the offensive line, but the Bakhtiari decision was about David Bakhtiari's situation first and foremost. Yeah, and, and it was good. I mean, Brian Gutekunst said, I mean, he didn't feel comfortable, him personally, putting Bakhtiari in that position. I'm sure David, if he had his druthers, would be out there against New Orleans. But the story I'll tell everybody now that we have a real in-house example is Innis Gaines. I mean, Innis Gaines tears his ACL during his junior year against TCU. He comes back playing for TCU, comes back in six months, and ends up tearing the same knee again. Yeah. That's what you're looking to avoid. The Packers, it, like they mentioned, there's a 9-11 to 11 month window there for a lot of offensive linemen returning from this injury. 
there's really, especially early in the season here where they have some fluidity, there's some, you know, versatility that they can take advantage of with that offensive line. It's better to be able to make sure that Bakhtiari is in a good spot so that this team that has real Super Bowl hopes for 2021 can have their best player available down, you know, whatever point it comes, but definitely down the stretch. Yeah. And just to provide some perspective on the timeline here, the fastest we've ever seen anybody come back from an ACL in Green Bay was Brian Balaga a few years ago. And Bakhtiari being on PUP for at least the first six weeks of the 2021 season, essentially when he's eligible to come off PUP within a week or so is almost almost matches up to Brian Balaga's yeah. timeline. So now every injury is different. I'm not saying the Packers are following the Brian Balaga timeline because every indiv- individual and every injury is different, but just to provide and that it, perspective. That was there. eye-opening too when Balaga did that. you got to remember he yes. actually toured that at the beginning of November and he was ready for week one. This is a little bit different. This was New, New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. Whatever New Year's it was Eve, week seven, yeah, pr- practice of week 17. Yeah, Almost two full months later. So Bakhtiari very much still on the same timeline, just trying to make sure you can get him healthy. Yeah, and with regard to a new punter, a trade is in the works for Corey Bjorquez. Bjorquez. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly. Punted three seasons for the Buffalo Bills, was in training camp this summer with the Los Angeles Rams, but the Rams decided – Despite Bjork was having a really impressive preseason, they decided to stick with their tried-and-true veteran, the all-pro Johnny Hecker. So the Packers seeing that Bjork was was going to become available, but the Packers being a conference runner-up from a year ago, very, very low in the waiver claim order, Brian Gutekunst was not going to take the chance that this punter could be claimed in front of him. So a little swap of draft picks for the future down the road guarantees that the Packers get him. Bjorquez doesn't actually go on waivers, and he's on his way to Green Bay to join the Packers. And this is a punter that Brian Gutekunst, the personnel staff, feel is uh, is one of these young players with the arrow pointing up. And you just have to look at his statistics from 2019 in Buffalo to 2020 yep. to see um, you know, that, that arrow pointing up for this young man. Yeah. And you know, the bills, they ended up going in a different direction. They signed Matt hack, who was a little bit more of an established punter this off season. So that allowed Bjorquez to kind of hit free agency and a month into it, uh, felt like maybe Los Angeles Rams, a place where he's actually from Southern California might be a good fit for him. As you mentioned here, there was a five time, four time all pro and Johnny Hecker there, Yeah, but Hecker's had some, you know, injuries. There's been some issues there the last few seasons. So it was a legitimate competition right down to the final bell. There was a contract track thing kind of going on with with yes. Hecker as well which is also partly why Bjorquez maybe wasn't brought back to Buffalo because of becoming a restricted free agent and and with the depressed cap and all of that so lots of circumstances lead to this thing and now suddenly Corey Bjorquez is a Green Bay Packer but and as I told people in insider inbox because they were asking about special teams what are the Packers doing to improve their special teams I said that they are turning over all the stones now they are taking a look. They are casting a wide net. J.J. Molson came back on the practice squad as a kicker. Uh, I don't remember the last time the Packers kept a kicker on the initial roster going into the season on the practice squad. Obviously, Molson was there at the end of last season as the COVID replacement. Right. You know, there's questions there about you know how they're going to handle these coverage units. Oh, at the end of the day, J.K. Scott, probably the most talented punter uh, during my time on the beat that the Packers have had, but consistency was an issue. They feel like Bjorquez is a guy that can help kind of calm those waters a little bit. And with some cold weather experience, having punted in Buffalo for a couple seasons. Absolutely. Yeah. And even though he's a left-footed punter, a right-footed holder, right-footed or a right-footed right, holder. Right, yeah. <laughs> that would be a trick, Wes. That would be something. <laughs> that would actually get some ratings. Uh, a right-handed Handed. Uh, gentleman, yeah. despite being a left-footed punter. So well, we'll see how it all shakes out. Yeah, well... Um, Quickly here, Wes, some sponsor business. Sirius XM NFL Radio delivers hard-hitting analysis and up-to-the-minute NFL news that true football fanatics need 24-7, 365. And at Cousin Subs, we have something for everyone, like our Wisconsin cheese curds, mac and cheese, golden fries, and creamy shakes, all paired with your favorite sub or sub in a bowl. Cousin Subs, we believe in better. All right, a few other things to touch on here with regard to the Packers roster as it sits right now. We, we've talked before about uh, about how as rare as it can be, you can never necessarily count out these guys that show up partway through training camp. Everybody kind of wonders, like, why are you bringing someone in like after the first preseason game? How does he get a chance to show what he can do? Well, 
three guys, Dennis Kelly, Ike Yadam, the cornerback, Kelly being the backup offensive tackle, Ike Yadam at cornerback, and Chauncey Rivers, the edge rusher, all three of those guys show up after training camp starts, and all three of them end up surviving final cuts and are on this Packers roster. And uh, and Rivers, a really interesting story, in just in terms of a lot of the connections here. He went the junior college route, played at East Mississippi Community College, the school made famous by the Last Chance U show on Netflix, which was also a school that Zadarius Smith attended earlier in his career. Rivers also went to the same high school, not at the same time, but the same high school as Preston Smith, and both of those guys also coming out of Mississippi State and the Packers with other younger Mississippi State players like Kylan Hill, like Elton Jenkins, guys that Chauncey Rivers played with. It must not have been a whole lot of a big transition for that guy to walk into the Packers locker room. A lot of familiar faces. Yeah, I think him. he even said he walked in the cafeteria and like Preston was like laughing when, he, when they <laughs> locked eyes the first time. So yeah, for a guy that's showing up on August 5th or whatever it was, I mean, obviously uh, he's been around this, some of these guys on this football team. You know, the thing that's great about Chauncey Rivers' story is this is a guy that when you talk about the deck kind of being stacked against you last year, he's trying to make Baltimore's roster as an undrafted free agent during COVID. Yeah. Uh, he sticks on the practice squad all year, got elevated for one game, but ultimately came back trying to crack the roster this year. And then a week into training camp gets cut. Now, as I wrote in the story that we have on Packers.com, that is a death knell usually for players that are undrafted free agents or first year players getting cut the first week of camp because you know, everybody likes to talk about, oh, who's going to, these guys are going to get claimed or, or this guy's not going to be able to make our 53, but the other 30 teams are going to want him. The reality is, is that these teams have been developing their own rosters for three, four months. When a guy comes free at the beginning of August, it's a really long odds for him to make the 53 man roster. Some have done it, you know, Jamal, or Jamal Crawford, James Crawford, right. a number of years ago did it with Green Bay, but for Rivers to come in and make the statement that he made, he's not the tallest pass rusher you've ever seen, six two, 259 pounds, but he just was explosive. And, and as he said, I mean, he had a fire in inside himself after the Baltimore Ravers, Ravens cut him. And for Green Bay, it was perfect timing. They just lost Randy Ramsey to that ankle injury. They needed bodies at outside linebacker with Sedarius Smith being injured, with Rashawn Gary and Preston Smith sitting out of the preseason games. And here's Chauncey Rivers getting a big opportunity, and he capitalized it, especially against Buffalo. I was going to say, we've talked a lot, and we were talking last week about there's always going to be somebody who states their case and, and earns a roster spot in that last preseason game, somebody that you don't think is necessary, or somebody who is definitely on the bubble has not uh, solidified a spot on the roster. And I would say really two guys in my mind did that. Rivers did that. Yep. The Packers had been, with, with the Smiths and Gary not playing in the preseason games, the Packers had not had much edge rush pressure in the preseason games. And then in the first half against Buffalo, Buffalo's starters are on the field, and Chauncey Rivers gets a 10-yard sack of all-pro quarterback Josh Allen. Those are the kinds of things that, uh, that make people take notice of you. The other guy, I would say, in my opinion, earned his roster spot in that final preseason game in Buffalo was the sixth-round draft pick out of Boston College, Isaiah McDuffie. Yeah. This was a, a young man who was dealing with, I believe it was a hamstring injury, early in camp, missed some time, um, missed the first preseason game, if I'm not mistaken. Second preseason game, you know, did fine a little bit up and down. Then the third preseason game, he showed up to play. Um, defense, special teams, it was all there. And uh, as a result, the Packers end up keeping five inside linebackers, McDuffie being that fifth guy to go along with, uh, with the other veterans in front of him. Yeah, I was able to play the whole game. Packers only had three inside linebackers active for that, so they <clears throat> excuse me, rotated Way Ray Wilburn and Scooter Harris in the other spot. And here's Isaiah McDuffie, every single play, serving as a communicator, being out there leading this defense. Nine tackles, whatever it was, a half sack. I mean, the guy was impactful. Yeah. And as Brian Gutekunst was asked, because he's like, okay, you kept five inside linebackers. We also have to look at it as they only have four safeties right now, one of which, Vernon Scott, is dealing with the hamstring issue. The two positions, when you talk about core four on special teams that usually get a lot of play, are inside backer and safety. Yep. Isaiah McDuffie's going to play. Ty Summers is going to play. Oren Burks, I thought, had a really nice camp. He's going to play. Packers are talking about rebuilding these special teams units. They have a core there that I think they really can kind of circle around, in addition to the fact 
that McDuffie's a really solid long-term prospect for that inside linebacker position. Yeah, no question about it. A couple of other thoughts. Uh, the undrafted rookie streak that, uh, that we talk about a lot, Jack Heflin, the defensive lineman out of Iowa from Northern Illinois to Iowa, now to Green Bay, ends up making the roster. And then with regard to that wide receiver competition that we spent so much time talking about, the last wide receiver standing, so to speak, uh, earning the number six spot, Malik Taylor, with three of the other wide receivers that he beat out being brought back onto the yeah. practice squad, that being EQ St. Brown, Jawan Winfrey, and Chris Blair. Yeah, and Devin Funches, who I think a lot of people had almost sharpied in for a roster spot at the beginning of camp, he ends up not being there. This is why I love the preseason, Mike, and this is why, while I agree you don't need four preseason games, you may not even need three. Yeah. Malik Taylor is the reason why you need preseason games because I think if this is just a training camp competition, it's going to be a lot harder for him to make the roster. But with Green Bay sitting there, four veterans, during this entire preseason, Malik Taylor played a lot of football, maybe more than anybody on the Packers offense this offseason. When you factor in the fact he was also at the offseason program, OTA's minicamp, this is a guy I think a lot of people sort of quote-unquote left for dead in, in this, this, you know, this really tight, hotly contested receiver competition. Yep. And he comes out right out of the gate, 14 catches, 185 yards, leads the NFL in the preseason in receptions. This is a really impressive young athlete. And as Matt LaFleur said on Wednesday, the talent's always been there, but you're starting to see him bring some of those other things to the table. And then obviously the, the, the cherry on top is the fact that he also can contribute on special teams. Yeah, and how can you not like Jack Heflin's story? Oh, my I mean, God, it's the best. The young man, Prophetstown, Prophetstown Illinois, a uh, small town. He's, uh, you know, he, he even said he knows he's got a lot of people following him, a lot <laughs> of people counting on him. He's, you know, he, but, you know, jokingly, it's like, you know, he, he wants to – he wants to make a name for himself, make a name for his town. I mean, all all that kind of stuff. And uh, and here he is. The you know the Packers have the four veterans on the defensive line in front of him with Kenny Clark, Dean Lowry, Kingsley Kiki, Tyler Lancaster. They spend a fifth round pick on T.J. Slayton yeah. out of Florida, who was also impressive during camp and the preseason games. So there's there's five defensive linemen and here. Jack Heflin ends up carving out a sixth spot at that at that position for, for him to stick. And, and just, uh, you know, if you haven't seen, he's now done two press conferences in the media auditorium. Both of those videos are posted on Packers.com from within the last week to 10 days. So if you haven't seen um, the interviews that have been done with Jack Heflin, you got to go check him out. This is a, he's, he's a fun young man to talk to. He's a fun young man to talk to. He's amazing to listen to, but actually the most underrated thing about him, I love nonverbal communication. Like, I just, I, I live for it. It's something that's one of my big things I sort of majored in. If you ever, don't just listen to what he says. Watch his press conferences, because to me, it looks like the mayor of a small town, like, going up on the podium, just kind of holding court. Yeah. I mean, he looks so comfortable. He has kind of a posture there that he's just... It, but, at, but at the same time, it's kind of a hard on your sleeve kind it is. of thing. It's just, it's, 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 it's endearing, in it's a sense. Incredible. It's incredible. So, yeah. It's incredible yeah. to hear him listen. It's incredible to hear him talk about his story because, yes, there's been undrafted players year after year that have come through here and have had success. And some of them are like Alan Lazard, who just for whatever reason got overlooked by NFL scouts, even though he was incredibly productive at Iowa State. Yeah. Or, or Chris Barnes. Just people just miss on these guys. Jack Heflin, you almost get the feeling that nobody was really looking for him, <laughs> right. you know, coming out of Prophetstown. And the fact that he didn't have any D1 scholarship offers and the fact that he didn't build a chip on his shoulder because of it, it just made him work harder. And out of all the things he said, in addition to the fact mentioning that when Jerry Montgomery called him and woke him up to tell him he'd made the roster, saying that that was the best day of his life, you couldn't also, you talk about tugging at the heartstrings a little bit, the story that he told of calling his mom, Judy, to tell her, hey, i would made the roster. And if you remember the first presser he did with the media, you know, he was saying, I used to tell her I'm going to play at Iowa. And she's like, okay, yeah. He went and played at freaking Iowa. <laughs> and now he's in the National Football League. Well, and then, and then his, his season at Iowa is shortened by COVID. Yeah. And then didn't the Hawkeyes end up losing their bowl game? Wasn't, yeah. wasn't their bowl game? I mean, you talk about trying to get noticed and, and get film out there for scouts and everything. There, all kinds of things working against this young man, and now here he is on the Packers roster for week one of the 2021 season. Yeah, and you got to feel good about it. And again, Mike, it's not a position where there's a lot of special teams, you know, incorporated with defensive line. No, I mean, no, he got, had he had to earn it. He he had to earn yeah. it at his 
at his position. He didn't really have a whole lot of other chances. And for Green Bay, I think this is great, though, because not only do you get another developmental defensive lineman in the system, Tyler Lancaster's working through the elbow injury. T.J. Slayton is an incredible talent, but obviously still kind of raw. Jerry Montgomery's talked about that. You really get the feeling with Heflin. This is a guy that they kind of were looking for last year. Dude that can go in there and play a dozen snaps rotationally if you need him to to be yep. able to give some of those other guys a breather. Yeah. One other thing we need to touch on before we sign off for today, Wes, the Packers' week one game against the New Orleans Saints has been moved to Jacksonville, Florida. Obviously, thoughts and prayers and hopes and everything else going out to all the folks down there in New Orleans and the Louisiana area dealing with the uh, the aftermath of Hurricane Ida. But one of the... Uh, one of the results of that from a football perspective is Jacksonville, the Jacksonville Jaguars stadium will be hosting the Packers and the Saints. Kind of a trade-off here of you're trading the noise of the Superdome for the heat of Jacksonville. The biggest difference, though, in terms of calling it a trade is that the noise is a one-sided thing. Yeah. That's only for the visiting team. The heat is a two-sided thing, though the Saints will be able to pick the sideline that's more in the shade, you know, for the for the bulk of uh, of the first half there with a the late afternoon kickoff. But that being said, it is uh, the heat down there in Florida will be something both teams have to deal with on September 12th. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to be crying about not having to travel down to that game. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll be okay covering that one from Lambeau Field from afar. Remember that 16 opener? Oh, I'll never forget it. <laughs> we're, d- we're, down there, we're down there doing our pregame like, social media live hits and stuff like that. And we're, you know, we're, <laughs> we're dressed up light, dre- dressed up all nice like we are when, uh, when we go on the road with the team. And... Oh my goodness! Like it wasn't even noon Eastern time yet, and we were sweating bullets out there. I like, just remembered walking cow. out there and locking eyes with J. Ron Elliott, and I'm like, J. Ron, it's too hot. It's too hot, <laughs> and he just laughed it off. But it's just, it was, you know, it was funny. T.J. Slayton actually mentioned this earlier during the training camp because he's from Florida, obviously South Florida. <laughs> Somebody had asked him like, "Is this, is it this hot?" Because they were complaining about how hot it was at training camp. Is this this hot in Florida? <laughs> and Slayton's like, "What?" <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a lot hotter than this. This isn't. This doesn't compare to Florida. Yeah. So, I, I will say this: the, the one thing, I'm, the point I made in inbox is that both teams are going to have to contest with it. The the Saints are going to have it a little easier. They'll be able to re- wear their road whites, as you mentioned. They'll be able to pick where their bench is. But the bigger issue there is that if you're playing this in New Orleans, the Superdome is the, the loudest venue. That in whatever Century Link is called now are the two loudest venues in the National Football League for my money. So that was going to be working against the Packers. New Orleans was going to have it on their side on offense. This is something both teams are going to have to adjust to, and they're going to have to adjust to it quick. So hydration is going to be a key, cardio is going to be a key, and ultimately just mental toughness, being able to fight through those emotions. Because uh, I'll tell you this, this is the type of game I thought would have been really fun to play on a fast track. Uh, this will not be a fast track. Yeah, and especially when it comes to the fourth quarter in a season opener when you're when you're not quite sure how – in shape all of these uh, all these guys are it's it's going to be an interesting one for sure but we got a whole nother week to uh, to talk about leading up to that for now we'll call it a wrap on this edition of Packers Unscripted be sure to follow all of our coverage of the team on Packers.com for Wes I'm Mike thank you for tuning in everybody we'll see you next time